Well, Larry, thanks for joining us today and taking a little time out of your day to uh, join us on the MSUM Dragons podcast. Well, I'm not too busy. Well, <laughs> we're about to be busy. We've got uh, Dragon basketball coming up soon, which you were a, a former coach. Uh, what, what all did have you done at MSUM? Because there's a long, long list. Well, I was a basketball, baseball coach, basketball coach, athletic director. So dabbled in a little bit of all of it? Yeah. Good. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to feature you on the podcast this week was it's, it's obviously Veterans Day, and we wanted to feature a, a veteran with deep ties to MSUM, and your name was quickly out of everyone's mouths as someone to to come here and talk with, could you, or would you be uh, willing to share, you know, your, your service uh, in the military? How much time do you have? Long story, we got all the time there is. <laughs> well, uh, I was in the service World War I, not, not one, you know. Yeah. Two. Not that old. No, not good. And I, I went into the Navy for some reason or other, and then for some unknown reason I got into the medi medical end of it. Well, after after six weeks of training, I went and they figured that I could take care of people that are yeah. hurt. You know? And... Uh, was transferred to New York City and stayed there for six weeks. And then they asked for volunteers to go overseas, and of course we all jumped at the chance, you know. Sure. <laughs> Little did we know. But anyhow, the ship that we went over on was a an LST, which is a landing ship tank, what it stands for. And they're built to go into, they're flat bottom ships, they're built to go into beaches and unload whatever they got on and go in in a high tide, you know, mm -hmm. so you'd look back and no water back there at all. It's kind of strange. So anyhow, that was the, uh, the plan was, of course, for D-Day. That was the whole thing that they were thinking about. We went over with a convoy of maybe a hundred ships in the middle of winter. These are flat bottom ships. That was quite a ride. <clears throat> and then we got over there uh, to England finally and this was maybe two months before D-Day. And we were just not doing much, just getting ready. And we didn't know, we didn't know who was going where or whatever, but in looking back, I know now that, you know, the, our people planned certain plan to hit that beach, hoping that the Germans didn't know that. And it turned out that the Germans were ahead of us on that and they were well aware that there was going to be an invasion. And originally these flat bottom ships that we were on were planned to go in on high tide, wait till the tide went out. Sure. And, and, open the doors and unload whatever you got on there. But then before the invasion, before D-Day, they found out that the Germans had, at some time or other, planted explosives all along that beach, which made it impossible to go in then all the way. So now we're, there we were, we had to get all those people and their equipment in. And it turned out to be a bad affair, as you well know, and mm -hmm. a lot of casualties. 
our job was to uh, get leave our ship in in a jeep a jeep that's will go on water pick up wounded bring them back to the ship and eventually take them back to England but it was it was a really a bad affair yeah what was your rank at that time? Pharmacist mate, third class. There you go. <laughs> Not too many bars on that shirt, but it. Uh, <laughs> no. So you were you were there on on the beach that day and saw one of the. Well, it was an unbelievable sight and experience. Ah. I mean, uh, we we were hundred yards about from a. A battleship, which was lobbing shells in, in the shore, and the sound was amazing, of course. And then the idea with these amphibious jeeps it gave me a lesson in uh, listening to our instructions. Anyhow, we had to, to drive off the amphibious ship with these amphibious jeeps and go out and pick up people out there and then uh, bring them back to the ship. And the very the first time this tried this, you know, we had all these army guys on there and their jeeps too. And they opened the doors and put on the ramp and army guy, first army guy in his jeep took off, and he just took off and it sunk right down. Just at the jeep. Yeah. It did something about the way it was loaded or whatever. Anyhow, it, we fished him out of there, and and then I always told my basketball players about discipline. The Army captain says, okay, next. And it's, so the next guys were driving off. They all went off okay, but... Uh, mm-hmm. That one was not loaded correctly, I guess. But that was discipline. I wouldn't yeah. want to have been the second in line. When did you uh, come home? Well, I suppose we were uh, after D-Day, maybe a couple of months, we made several trips back and forth across the channel and picked up people and whatever. Then we one day they said uh, we're going to go and load on this ship and we go to Scotland and here's the USS United States it was a converted luxury liner you know mm-hmm. on we go and then when, when we get on we find out that there are 2,000 German prisoners of war on there too <laughs> so we had quite a load coming back to the United States and then I thought, boy, this is great. We're going back to the States. My part in this war is over. I go back and find out, no, you're going to go in the Marines. The Marines didn't have their own medics. They'd take the Navy guys. So on the train and down to North Carolina, Camp Lejeune, and put on a Marine uniform and then you were a Marine. I was a Marine. It was, you know, the Navy uniform didn't have any pockets for some weird reason, I don't know. And the very first day we were on Camp Lejeune, my friend and I, we had been issued Marine clothing. And of course, it had pockets. So anyway, we were walking back after eating, and we got both of us with our hands in our pockets. And up rode a jeep with a marine major in there and a driver. Get over here, he said. For, for 15 or 20 minutes, he lectured us. What was going to happen to us unless we straightened up and looked like marines? <laughs> <laughs> so, God. Oh, well. Well, that's on the job training for you. <laughs> the marines. 
So you, you came back and you were a Marine. Um, yeah. When did you well, went, end your service officially? Well, long after that. Even long after that? Well, I went over to the Pacific then, joined the Marines, 4th Marine Division over there. Mm. On Veterans Day today, what, what does Veterans Day mean to you? Well, all I can think of is the guys that didn't make it back, you know. And I ran over a lot. And, um, you know, you just think about wars and it's just, I don't know. It's a sad day in a way. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. For a lot of people. My grandfather did serve. Um, in World War II. Mm -hmm. I know he has two bronze stars. Um, and it was funny because he, I, I uh, it was funny because my dad, he never talked to my dad about what yeah. he saw yeah. and what he went through and what he did. But when I was in high school um, and I started to show an interest in history, and there's a living, breathing archive of yeah. what was seen and what was first-hand experience. And when I think about Veterans Day, I, I think about obviously my grandfather, but I think about that first-hand experience is, is being lost year over year and doing things like this excites me for an opportunity to capture a perspective that, uh, yeah. you know, we all need to learn from those events. We all need to learn what that kind of loss feels like, what that kind of environment is like, so that hopefully we never have to repeat it again. Yeah. Yeah, I had one brother in the war in Africa, and the other brother was uh, Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. They both made it back without wounded. Lucky. Lucky McLeods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And anyhow, when the war was finally over, we heard about the bomb being dropped. We thought the war was over. So they're going to send the Marines home. But they're not going to send us, the Navy guys. <laughs> we were so so there we go the marines took off to the heroes welcome back in the united states you know and so anyhow they put us on a ship and we went to honolulu and we not telling us where we're going why or whatever you know we get there and next thing i know they're loading us on an aircraft carrier no airplanes on it I said, where are we going? Oh, the, nobody knew. Ten days later, and about 6,000 miles later, we're in Guam. <laughs> Can you imagine? What? Yeah. <laughs> Guam. I <laughs> mean, good God. Anyhow, two, two weeks in Guam, then, then load us on another little ship. Now we're going home. 25 days to San Diego, <laughs> we made it home. But, you know, things like that went on. It's crazy. It is, and I think we, we kind of take for granted that romanticized version of the war is over, everyone got the hero's welcome, and everyone got the ticker tape parades and all those sorts of things, yeah. but some guys got shipped to Guam instead. <laughs> I eventually ended up in... Minneapolis and got discharged there. And the first thing they did was lecture you a little bit and then they gave us $300. And then we had to watch a movie. Hmm. <laughs> and the movie was really funny. I mean, it shows this guy just got discharged and he heads right for the bar, you know, instead of the bar. And, he's, and he looks down 
and the other end of the bar, and there is the ugliest woman you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> I really bad. She says, oh. So he has a few more. He looks down. She's starting to look pretty good now. <laughs> That's it. I'm trying to think, what's the lesson here? Of course. Oh, fine. I finally got out of there anyhow. So I didn't, I didn't have a home to go to any place. So I thought I'd visit my sister in Detroit, Michigan. She lived there with her family. So I get out in the street and I got to get a cab to go to the train station. Get in the cab and uh, the cab driver said, well, he said, tomorrow's the big day. I thought, oh, damn, now they're celebrating our return. I said, oh, I said, what is it? He said, it's the opening of fishing. <laughs> I thought, well, that's, I guess that's right. Pretty important in Minnesota. <laughs> it's amazing how life just Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> continues to go on after all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's really all the questions I had for you today. I wanted to keep it kind of short and sweet and well, appreciate I'm sorry. you. I'm sorry I can't be more, I don't know what about it, but I mean, I... Larry, yeah, it's fascinating. I've never talked much about it, and it's... No, I, I'm an ex-history major. I wanted to teach history and learned about all those moments in, in time through textbooks and documentaries and, and things like that. And then mm -hmm. nothing compares to each mm -hmm. individual case, mm -hmm. each individual story, experienced it completely different from the guy sitting next to him to the person over there and uh, saw different things, takes a different perspective with yeah. it. So I've always enjoyed exactly what you just shared with us mm -hmm. today, so thank you for doing so. In, in light of yeah. missing out on the, the grand welcome, you know, definitely yeah. thank you for your service. And <laughs> well, I don't expect to be thanked. That's I think that says more about had, it than had anything. to be done anyhow. Thanks, Larry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. To... Oh.